Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'd like to start by acknowledging and thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support my podcast on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors patron family. Visit patreon.com slash talking tutors for more information. Join the Talking Tudors patron family and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor themed goodies, you'll have access to patron only monthly giveaways. January's prize is a copy of Sandra Vasoli's brilliant new novel, Pursuing a Masterpiece. Thank you so much to the author for sponsoring this wonderful prize. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. Next weekend, I'll be chatting to historian Matt Lewis about Richard III and the Princes in the Tower. You don't want to miss it. Further details will be published on Patreon. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks, and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtutors.threadless.com. I would love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tudors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag I love Talking Tudors. Now, on to today's episode. I'm excited that joining me on the show to talk about Tudor pretenders is Nathan Amin. Nathan is an author and researcher from West Wales who focuses on the 15th century and the reign of Henry VII. He wrote The House of Beaufort in 2017, an Amazon number one bestseller in three historical categories, and Henry VII and the Tudor Pretenders, Simnel, Warbeck and Warwick, also an Amazon number one bestseller, was released in April 2021. As of 2020, he's a trustee and founding member of the Henry Tudor Trust, and in 2022 was elected a Fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Our conversation's coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sales.
Welcome back to Talking Tudors, Nathan. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for inviting me back for round two. (laughs) Yes, round two, and it's been quite a while since round one, so it would be wonderful if you could just introduce yourself to our listeners and just tell us a little bit about you and your background. Yeah, uh, my name is Nathan Amin, and I'm a writer and researcher from West Wales, uh, home of the Tudor family. My research generally revolves around the Welsh Tudors, uh, the life and times of Henry the Seventh and his background. So I do study the Beaufort family, that is his maternal family, and I do study the Tudor family, which is his paternal family. Um, and hopefully people find all of this very interesting and new to them normally uh, compared to the usual uh, Henry VIII, the Six Wives and Elizabeth. So hopefully I'm bringing something different to the table. Fantastic. Yes, I'm sure it will be absolutely fascinating. And we're actually here to talk about your book called Henry VII and the Tudor Pretenders, Simonor, Warburg and Warwick. But before we dive in to talk about them a little bit more, why did you actually decide to focus on this particular subject? Well, the truth is, I don't feel comfortable at the moment, perhaps writing a full biography of Henry VII. I possibly will do that one day, but that is a very big project. So I was looking at um, at an aspect of his life or his reign that hasn't really been explored deeply. Um, And that is the princes in the tower and the pretenders. Now, there have been works done on Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simnel separately. And they have tended to be written from quite a revisionist point of view, um, supporting their claims. It's not really something that I... My gut feeling initially was that both of these pretenders were imposters. And I did want to go and look at the subject a lot deeper, but bring in Henry VII into this to see what he was up to and what his point of view was. Um, And really, it's the first book that I'm aware of that's put both the pretenders um, together in one book, but also tied it all up by looking at it from Henry's point of view. You know, these words separate movement. I mean, you know, each pretender was separate, but this is part of a much wider issue for the Tudor regime. And we need to look at it from the angle as well. And it explains a lot about Henry the man and Henry the king later in his reign. You know, he has a reputation for being dark and suspicious and paranoid. But we need to find out why that is. You know, people don't become like that for no reason. So, so yeah, pretty much it was um, it was a book that no one had really written. So just like my Beaufort book, it was waiting for somebody just to take up the challenge. Fantastic. And I think it's such an interesting lens to use to look at this this period of time. Now, Nathan, the traditional narrative tells us that Henry VII won his crown on the battlefield at Bosworth, thereby personally uniting the houses of Lancaster and York and ruled pretty much, you know, uncontested and peacefully until his death in 1509. So do you think this this story, this kind of narrative is actually grounded in fact? Uh, it's not, you know, it's grounded in what Henry wanted to happen. Uh, we're often presented with this idea that Shakespeare invented this idea of him un- uniting the houses. This was very much Henry's personal project. He believed in it and he came to England determined um, to see it through. Now, the reality is, is that Henry was the most unlikely figure to sit on the English throne. Um, and he was coming to something that was essentially a poison chalice. You know, between 1399 and 1485, no fewer than five kings have been deposed, uh, twice in Henry VI's case. Um, and his rise had only really been been due to this internal factionism within the House of York. So, you know, he was never going to come to the throne, this complete nobody unknown to England, and not really be challenged for it. You know, many of, his, many of the people who supported him to the crown, they may have perhaps viewed him as being a bit of a puppet, but they quickly discovered that Henry Tudor was his own man with his own idea of doing things. So there was clearly going to be some people unhappy with that. You know, the recent history of Kings of England had been quite uh, precarious. You know, they'd been turfed from their thrones. And once you know how to unmake a king, if you're not happy with him, there's always the opportunity to try and kick this one off the throne. So no, Henry was not stable when he came to his throat to the throne. He was very vulnerable. One of his main disadvantages is was also ironically one of his strengths, and that was that he was a complete unknown to England and the English nobility. So on one hand that is a weakness, but on the other hand it means that he can do things 
his way and he's not tied to the burdens of the past. Um, but, you know, the, the, the truth is he came to England. He thought that he was going to unite the houses and everything, everything was going to be nice and peaceful. But in the words of Polydor Virgil, his court geographer, he soon got harassed by the treachery of his opponents. Pretty sharpish once he got hold of the of the crown. Fantastic. And I'd love to hear more just about his first year on the throne. You know, you've obviously said this is a kind of shaky period for him. So what were the main triumphs, I suppose, and the main challenges in that first year of his Tudor reign? Well, you know, the main triumphs are, are, are huge. Obviously, first and foremost, he wins the crown at Ballard Bosworth, and then he marches on down to London um, to be crowned King of England. Um, it's interesting that he got crowned King before Parliament assembled to officially make him king, um, so he, he was crowned king in a in a in a large extravagant coronation at Westminster Abbey. And a week later, Parliament opens in which his claim to the crown is formally endorsed by the three estates of the realm. So the Commons, the Lords, and the Church they all accept him as king. They principally make him not just king, but they say that in future no one else can take the crown unless they're of Henry VII's blood. And that's quite a key phrase. That's not Henry VII and Elizabeth of York's blood. That is just Henry VII's blood. For example, if he hadn't married Elizabeth of York, it wouldn't have mattered. Polit- you know, it would have mattered politically, but legally it wouldn't have mattered. And, you know, that that's a major coup. And that is still something that is in is the case today. You know, the current king is still a direct descendant of Henry the Seventh. So that's a ma- that's a magnificent achievement for him. Then, of course, he does go on to marry Elizabeth of York. Um, we're often told that he delayed the wedding, delayed, delayed, delayed. Nonsense. He married her pretty much two days after he received a papal dispensation to do so. He did marry her as quick as he could. You know, he wasn't a fool. He knew that much of his support came from his promise to marry Elizabeth of York. And within weeks, if not already, she was pregnant with an heir. So Henry's first six months get off to a good start. You know, he gets crowned. Parliament endorses his claim. He marries and uh, his wife is pregnant. That's a good start. But there are some issues brewing beneath the surface. Uh, Henry goes on a major progress to the city of York, um, you know, very much going into enemy territory. And that was apparently an assassination attempt on him. Uh, Somebody in the crowd tried to kill him before that man was subdued by the Earl of Northumberland. And then another conspiracy um, or a plot emerges in the West Country. So Henry's coming back south from York, and it turns out two brothers, the Staffords, are old loyalists to Richard III and the Duke of Clarence, have decided to try and lead a conspiracy in the West Country. They don't really get anywhere. They make a few chants. They raise a few banners. And primarily the man that they're trying to sponsor to become king is the Earl of Warwick. Um, The Earl of Warwick is a son of the Duke of Clarence. George, the man we're told, was drowned in a a butter mamsey wine. And he is still in the Tower of London. He's about 10 years old. And he is unquestionably the best placed person in the Yorkist line of succession. We have to assume at this point... It doesn't mean it's a fact and so on before I get trouble online. <laughs> but we have to assume at this point the princes in the tower, the sons of Edward IV, are, are dead because it's their death that has made Henry Tudor the king in the first place. But there is another Yorkist prince in the Tower of London at this point. That's the Earl of Warwick. So this rebellion that takes place between his, uh, by these two men, the Stafford brothers, they want Warwick to be king. But the problem is they don't have Warwick in their possession, and their conspiracy and their plot falls, and they are executed. Which brings us nicely, really, onto Lambeth Simno. Yes, it does. And I, I, of course, want to speak to you about each of these pretenders that you've written about, starting with the man you just mentioned, Lambert Simnel. So who was he, and how did he become the, the figurehead of a Yorkist rebellion? So the difficulty with this subject is that we only find out who Lambert Simler was after he was captured, which obviously opens up accusations that he was uh, a fake put forward by the Tudor regime. Now, my research would lead me to believe that Lambert Simler was the 10-year-old boy of an Oxford joiner, an Oxford carpenter. From what I understand, and the evidence is very thick on this, you know, it's very easy to try and believe 
exciting theories. But when you start to delve deeper into the boring history, these things fall apart very quickly. And it's, you know, you have to really overlook a lot of evidence to try and look, to try and see things the other way. This 1486 rebellion has failed in the West Country. They didn't have a leader. They wanted Warwick to be king, but Warwick in the tower. Now, this small group of, of agitators still around are basically a couple of Oxfordshire churchmen. This plot has its roots all around the Oxford town of Abington. There's an abbot called John Sant, and the abbot has found a 10-year-old boy. And he said, this 10-year-old boy is the Earl of Warwick. I believe this 10-year-old boy, his name is Lambert Simnel. We're often told that the name Lambert Simnel is a silly name that must be fake. There are plenty of Lamberts and plenty of Simnels living in England during this time, including Thomas Simnel, who lives in Oxford at this time. And I believe the Lambert Simnel is his son. So what I think has happened is that this little conspiracy in Oxfordshire has picked this boy to be their leader. So that now when they go out around England to try and lead a conspiracy, they actually have somebody in front of them, a little boy king that can draw people to its side. Uh, it does draw the support of John de la Poole, the Earl of Lincoln, who is another Yorkist prince, um, and more importantly, is based in Oxfordshire. That's where he's from. So it's very much a very small Oxfordshire conspiracy taking place. But they get no support in England. And the reason they get no support in England is because as soon as Henry VII hears about this plot, he has the real Earl of Warwick brought out of the Tower of London and paraded through the streets of London. So, you know, he, he takes him into St Paul's Cathedral and he introduces the real Earl to all of his nobility. So straight away, the nobility know the Earl of Warwick is secure under Tudor custody and he's in the Tower of London. So when this other plot is surfaced and saying, behold, this little boy is the real Warwick, nothing happens. So they have to leave and seek support in Ireland, which does work. So Lambert Simnel, as far as I'm concerned, is a 10-year-old boy picked in Oxfordshire to be a puppet of this conspiracy because they'd already tried to raise a rebellion once and it failed. And this is the second attempt, this time with a little boy king in front of them. Right, and you mentioned De La Poole there. Were, were there other main backers or was that kind of the only English main backer and then they obviously head overseas in order to get more support? And and also, if you could maybe just tell us, what was their plan? How did they plan to overthrow Henry? So um, John De La Poole is the only real um, notable English defector. There is also Francis Lovell. Francis Lovell was the best friend, the right-hand man of Richard III. He's still around at this point. He survived Bosworth. And it's no surprise that he wants to take down Henry the Seventh. John de la Poole is defected. His defection is curious. Some people like to point out that he would never have defected if he hadn't known that this boy was the real Warwick, his cousin. I'm hesitant to believe that. Uh, I don't know what Warwick, what John de la Poole's exact plans were, but I would surmise that when, if the invasion was successful, he was either going to do a switch, put the real Warwick on the crown of England with him as his number two. You know, he's right hand man, he's backer. Or he may even have tried to get the crown himself. The problem that he had in this scenario is that the support that was already brewing for this conspiracy was down to mainly household servants of George, Duke of Clarence, the old, uh, the Earl of Warwick's father. So they were shouting Warwick, Warwick in the streets. They were raising Warwick banners. This wasn't a conspiracy for. John de la Poole. This was a conspiracy for Warwick. He couldn't very well just come in and say, me, I'm the king. Um, he had to go along with the way the wind was blowing. The other person that did back this conspiracy was John de la Poole's aunt, uh, and that's the sister of Richard III and Edward IV, Margaret of York. Now, Margaret of York was, as her name suggests, a Yorkist princess, but she'd been across in Flanders for the previous 25 years, where she had married the Duke of Burgundy. By this point, she was a, a widower and very, as you can imagine, very cross and upset with Henry VII for basically ending her dynasty by killing Richard III. So she started giving money and support to this conspiracy. So the support isn't great, but there is two very important people involved here, and that is John de la Poole and uh, his aunt, Margaret of York. 
Tell us about, I have heard that there was, you know, a coronation, a sort of, and I say that in quotations, a coronation in Dublin in 1487. So given that the uh, the real Earl of Warwick is in the tower and, you know, most of the nobility is aware of this, how does this coronation come about? So they, they get in no support in England. So they, you know, they, they cross over to Ireland. Now, Ireland during this period, during the Wars of the Roses, was a staunchly Yorkist isle. So when... When a conspiracy turns up in Dublin with the Earl of Lincoln, John de la Poole, say that this boy in front of them is the real Warwick, the Irish believe it. Um, George Duke of Clarence, Warwick's father, was actually born in Dublin. So they they love the idea that this boy has come home and he's ready to lead an invasion. Um, you know, they didn't have BBC or, or iPhone breaking news alerts back then. They didn't know that in London the real Warwick was being paraded. They've taken everything at face value. So the Irish straight away get ready to fight, and they actually make Lambert Simnel a king of England in Dublin Cathedral. They crown him. Now, that's quite a, a preposterous thing to do, really, quite a daring thing to do. During his years in exile in Brittany, even Henry VII or Henry Tudor didn't crown himself a king. But yeah, they, they make him a king in Dublin. They recruit some German mercenaries. So with an army that's really, you know, you're talking 40% Irish, 40% German, maybe 10% English, if my maths make up. That's not right. <laughs> kind of. You, you, you get what I'm trying to say. Um, mainly a German-Irish army invades the north of England. And their plan is when they get to the north of England, all of that old famous support of Richard III in the north of England is going to join their side and they're going to take down the King of England. That doesn't happen. They get to the north of England... And they don't really get any support because the major nobles are A, happy under Henry VII, and B, they've got word that the real Warwick is in the Tower of London. This conspiracy and invasion is nonsense. They attract a few supporters from, they attract a few, you know, barons, nobody that super influential. But when they get to the city of York, the most famous northern city um, there is, the city in which Henry VII nearly got ex- uh, assassinated not too long ago, the famous city of Richard III, the York citizens closed the gates on the rebels and they refused to defect. They refused to give their support. They stay loyal to Henry Tudor. And I think that is quite telling. But, you know, the rebels have come too far at this point. Uh, so they decided to, just to go to war with the King of England. And why not? Two years earlier, Henry VII, Henry Tudor, had done exactly the same thing. And look what happened to him. He ended up on the throne. So always try to battle because you might die, but you might also end the day king. Given that obviously Henry VII has the real Earl of Warwick and he's aware that there's not much support in England for this particular rebellion, how's he, how does he react and respond? Is he concerned about this threat? Oh, absolutely. Um, not so much because of, you know, who Simner was saying, or his backers were saying what Simner was because he knew the true story, but it's more that he himself had done exactly the same thing. So he knew better than most what happens if you don't face down a threat you know Richard III had discovered the invasion of Henry Tudor too late and sat in the middle of his kingdom waiting for Henry to come to him Henry goes straight on the attack as soon as he knows his country's been invaded he amasses a massive royal army all of his nobles turn out for him and he goes straight north he goes straight for them and the two sides meet next to a village called Stoke in um, Nottinghamshire on the 16th of June, 1487, where, you know, the Royal Army was far bigger, far better prepared, and it wasn't easy, but eventually, you know, superior skill showed its side. Um, You know, it's like a good old sporting battle. You know, a, a good plucky underdog can only hold on for so long before they're overawed by a more powerful foe, and that's exactly what happens. The, the English Royal Army destroy the rebels in the field, and Lambert Simnel is captured. So does Henry actually take part in the fighting? No, I mean, so it's a criticism of Henry that he's not a soldier himself. Henry is a leader. He doesn't take part in the fighting. He he gets fully armoured. Um, that was a that is a theme throughout his throughout his reign. Whenever he's challenged, he gets in full armour. It looks good. It inspires the men. But he leaves the he leaves the real fighting to his commanders. You know, the the men who know exactly what they're doing and the men who can get him his victory. No, he's very much a on the periphery of the battlefield type of type of leader. And some say that's cowardly. I mean, 
it makes common sense to me. Why would you go on the battlefield, get killed and lose everything? It doesn't really make much sense to me. Um, And those days are coming to an end for Kings to do that. But yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're and thereabouts watching his troops that he's assembled do their job, basically. Yeah, and you said that, so Simnor is, is captured. So what happens to Simnor and the other co-conspirators and the, the sort of army that he's got with him? So Francis Lovell, um, I mean, the Irish, first of all, are completely slain. Uh, the Germans are slain in great numbers. Uh, of the English leaders, Francis Lovell, Richard III's best friend, disappears. We don't ever know what happens of him again. John de la Poole, the Earl of Lincoln, is killed. This apparently upsets Henry because he wanted to capture him to try and get more information out of him. But also it's kind of handy that he was slain, you know, removes a problem for Henry. And Lambert Simnel is captured. He's a 10-year-old boy and he's brought before the king to be grilled. Now, Henry is quite magnanimous. He understands that this young boy was just doing what he was told. He wasn't really his enemy. And in the investigation of Fallers, this is where we first learn that he's called Tot Lambert Simnel and he's a 10-year-old son of an Oxfordshire joiner. Rather than killing a little boy, because believe it or not, that's not what you do during these days, whether Richard III killed the Prince of the Tower or not, people believed it enough to basically topple him from his throne. So you don't kill children. So Henry VII actually puts him to work, and he puts Lambert Simnel in the royal kitchens to work. And he must have been quite a competent little boy, because he eventually grows up to become the trainer of the King's Hawks. And that is a quite a privileged position, you know, and he would have accompanied the king or at least prepared the king for when he went out hunting and hawking. And we know that Lambert Simnel lives deep into the reign of Henry VIII. We hear of him as late as 1525. So this is, what's that, uh, 40 years after the Battle of Bosworth, when he must have been in a, in a good, you know, middle-aged, uh, middle ages, living. And if there's one thing we know about Henry VIII, it's that he didn't like people living who had rival claims to his throne. So if there's any doubt whatsoever that this Lambert Simnel was really one of his distant York cousins, I'm sure Simnel would have quietly got the chop. Um, but he didn't. We, we know that he's alive and well, deep into Henry VIII's reign. Quite a nice little story. You know? I wonder what he's, wonder what he should tell his, his children around the dinner table that one day I was made a king in Dublin when I was a boy. Um, That's a fascinating story, isn't it? And, we, and you don't really hear too much about what happens to him after. So, And I'm just thinking, I don't think I've seen any sort of fictional accounts of, of Lambert Simnel. That would be an interesting narrative, wouldn't it, to imagine what he saw and what, what the time that he spent at the Tudor court. It would be. I mean, one of the people that he really remains close to is a chap called Thomas Lovell. Now, big confusion, there's Francis Lovell, this is Thomas Lovell, who's on the other side, the Tudor side. And Thomas Lovell was a ve- someone very close to Henry VII. He was one of those, you know, new men of Henry VII, somebody who really rose high by giving his support. And Lambert Simnel went to his funeral. Lambert Simnel was in his household in 1520s and went to his funeral. It's, it's, this funeral was the last time we year of Lambert Simnel. And I find it very interesting, though, again, what discussions those men must have had because they were on opposing sides all those years ago. Thomas Lovell fought for Henry VII at the Battle of Stoke Field. You know, they must have had some great discussions. You know, somebody needs to write that fiction book between these men. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. Now, let's turn our attention to Perkin Warbeck. And I'm sure our listeners have heard of this this person, Perkin Warbeck. He claimed to be Richard of Shrewsbury, so the Duke of York, second son of King Edward IV, and one of the so-called princes in the Tower. So how does this all come about and who were his main supporters? Perkin Warbeck appears in Ireland out of nowhere in 1491. Rumours are that he's a bastard son of Richard III before it's claimed that he's, as you say, Richard of Shrewsbury. Um, He then claims that he's the rightful king of England and he sets to work trying to claim the throne. Now, depending on your point of view, he is either the real Richard of York, who had been, he claimed that Edward V, his brother, had been killed in the tower and he had been given mercy by an executioner, which sounds a bit unreal. And he was slipped away out of England to live for eight years in wilderness before he could come back and claim his crown. That's what he claimed. The other viewpoint, which again is what he said himself after he was captured, and it's something that's really borne out by a lot of the investigations into Perkin Warbeck, is that he was just the son of uh, a boatman in the French city of low country city of Tournai. And he had been put forward by a small group of English agitators to claim that he was a king of England. Now, it's very key to note that a lot of people are cynical about this 
claimed that he was the son of a boatman because his confession must have been concocted by Tudor uh, to the regime. But the investigations are French and Portuguese, sorry, French and Spanish, and they are conducted before he was even captured. And it's the French and the Spanish who are telling Henry VII who this pretender was. Um, so we have to be careful about just writing off the story that he was truly just a boatman. But either way, he's 17 years old, he turned up in Ireland, and he's claiming to be a king of England. His backers... Uh, this is where things get quite interesting. There are two men who have remained enemies of Henry VII at this point. One is John Atwater and one is John Taylor. Now, John Taylor was a, a loyalist of Richard III. And most of Richard III's men after Bosworth, they cross the divide. You know, they're pragmatists. They decide some lose their jobs and their offices, but most of them just get on with it. John Taylor doesn't. He refuses to back down and he leaves England and he goes into exile in France. And France and England at this time are in a state of war. And while in France, he writes a letter back to England telling one of his friends, watch out for next year, something or someone's coming. And then lo and behold, in Ireland, Perkin Warbeck turns up. And who should be in Ireland at this point in the very same city as Perkin Warbeck? And that is John Taylor and John Atwater, two of these English rebels who just happened to be there with Perkin Warbeck, and they stay by his side throughout the whole conspiracy. You know, people like to like to believe the story of Perkin Warbeck turning up and being the real prince. Everyone wants the princes to have survived. Unfortunately, history is not a kind rom-com. It's messy, it's bloody, and things can be explained fairly simple most of the time. And in this case, I'm I'm quite content based on the investigations and based on the based on the coincidental appearance of John Taylor and John Atwater, these rebels in Ireland in 1491 with Perkin Warbeck. It's just another conspiracy to try and topple Henry Tudor. So how does Henry react to this particular threat? Does he take it seriously? He does take it seriously. The first thing is that the Irish refuse to support Perkin Warbeck. You know, they've just been completely wiped out four years earlier in battle. So they refuse to support another pretender, and they send him on his way. In fact, one of the Irish earls, the Earl of Kildare, refers to Perkin Warbeck as that French lad, which I think is quite telling. You know, was Perkin Warbeck still speaking with the French of his of his native uh, background? So they cross over to France. And like I said, it's very important to point out that France and England are at war. So, of course, the French king is going to welcome Perkin Warbeck with a warm embrace, and he gives him a royal retinue, gives him an, an, a handful of men, because this boy is apparently a prince of England. This is very provocative to Henry, Henry VII. Once again, we have to remember, Henry VII had been in exactly the same position himself not too long ago. He had been in France. He had been given men and an army. He had invaded and killed the king. Henry did not want to end up like Richard III, so he puts together a massive royal army, and he invades France. Now, he didn't invade France just because of this Perkin Warbeck issue. There was wider reasons why. But when he did invade France with the largest royal army assembled in the 15th century, one of his main terms was that Warbeck has to be captured or he has to leave France. If Warbeck leaves France, he will leave France. And the French king agrees. The French king orders Warbeck to get out of his country. Uh, he's not going to support him anymore. It's rubbish. It's nonsense go. And Warbeck leaves. But he doesn't give up. He goes across the border to Flanders, where a certain Margaret of York is living. And this is now the woman that he calls his aunt. And this woman embraces him as her only true nephew. And together they work to put together money and men to go and take down the evil to the tyrant who killed Richard III. Henry, he takes it seriously. This has always been taken to suggest that it means that he takes Warbeck's claim seriously. They're two different things. He doesn't take Warbeck's claim seriously, but he does take the threat seriously because somebody's still trying to invade and kill you. It doesn't matter what they're saying or whether they're believable. You still have to deal with that actual fact of threat. So he does take it seriously in that respect. So tell us what happens during Warbeck's first landing in England. So Perkin Warbeck spends two years putting together a modest army, and he leads an invasion towards Kent. 
Now, Kent is the most rebellious part of England during the medieval period. Kent loves to rebel. You know, any rebel worth their salt, they go to Kent. Warbeck sends 300 of his men ashore, and they are they are slaughtered within minutes. Now, it's very important to note this is not a royal army who's met them. This is the local people of Kent who are slaughtering all of these men who have landed on their beach. Warbeck is shocked, you know. They were supposed to embrace him as their king, and together they should have all marched on London, where he could reclaim the throne for the House of York. But they don't. They completely wipe out 300 of his men, and Warbeck's forced to flee, and he escapes by boat through the English Channel. Uh, He surfaces in Waterford in Ireland, where for the second time in a couple of weeks, when his men try to land, they're again wiped out. The Irish are having none of it. And then finally, Warbeck surfaces a couple of months later in Scotland, another country at war with England. I mean, he was always key to remember who was supporting him and why they support him. Are they supporting him because of who he claims to be? Or are they supporting him because they hate Henry Tudor? So that's two invasions Warbeck's tried to lead there. And they've both been embarrassing for him, humiliating. You know, he's got nowhere. People don't seem to be buying it within England, who he says he is. But he surfaces in Scotland, and he gets himself a new a new royal mentor, James IV. And together, they start to plot an evasion. You know, James IV wants to conquer Northern England. Perkin Warbeck, now styling himself Prince Richard of England, wants to become king. In 1497, they invade England. And on the very first day of the invasion, Perkin Warbeck is so scandalised and horrified by how dangerous and bloody war actually is, he turns around and runs away, and he runs all the way back to Edinburgh. This is a great humiliation. You know, the Yorkist kings were some of the bravest soldiers there ever was, Richard III, Edward IV, even John de la Poole, the Earl of Lincoln. These were brave, courageous warriors. Perkin Warbeck was not. He turned, he ran. The King of Scotland was embarrassed by him shouted at him and essentially withdrew his support. So that's within the space of 1495 to 1497, Warbeck tries to invade England a few times and it's just humiliating. You know, it's it's a farce. If he truly was the Prince of York, he had none of that famous military bearing. So what do you think was motivating him then? Was it just purely the the idea of obviously becoming king? Or, you know, if he wasn't the who he said he was, it's not really a sort of revenge thing for his family or to regain the dignity of his family. Do you think it was just purely that he thought, hey, this sounds good, I'll be king of England? I'm not even sure he really knew what he was doing. I mean, he'd been put forward to this when he was 17 by a couple of barkers. We have to try and put ourselves in that, in, in his shoes. You know, there is an element of, Perhaps him believing his own his own cause, you know, becoming so caught up in it all that he truly believed that he was actually Prince Richard. There's also perhaps was he had he grown ambitious, had he grown to like this? You know, he could have just been an adventurer. I mean, at the end of the day, he is a he's a traveling boy. Even, you know, without the prince angle, the real boy, Perkin Warbeck of Tony, does seem to be this teenage boy who tours around Europe. He's an adventurer. You know, he leads a nomadic lifestyle. What else is he really going to do? Go back to Tunay and raise a family? He, this clearly seems to be something that there's an attraction, a pull, and it's exciting to him. But I think by 1497, this year it all comes crashing down. And I think a big reason is this invasion. I think he truly finds out what he's into. He's getting no support. Men are dying all around him. By this point, he's got a wife. It's really starting to lose its loses luster for him. And so he's eventually captured. Tell us about this event and also a little bit about what happens when Warbeck is imprisoned in the tower. Um, Eventually, Warbeck leaves Scotland and he surfaces once more in another place that hates Henry VII, and that's Cornwall. The Cornish, in the summer of 1497, had led a rebellion against Henry VII, the tax rebellion, and they'd been crushed in battle at Blackheath. So the Cornish were simmering in resentment against Henry VII. And when Perkin Warbeck turns up and goes, hey, I'll be your king, he gets another army. They march towards, toward, through the West Country, but when they find out that Henry VII is coming towards them with another royal army, Warbeck does what he always does. He runs away. He gets captured in Bully Abbey 
and he's brought to London where he's shown to the crowds. Embarrassing. People are laughing, they're mocking him, and they're throwing stuff at him. But just after he's captured in Exeter, he was brought before the king, and they met face to face. And it was a year that Perkin Warbeck signs a lengthy confession in which he admits his background. Now, he doesn't just say, sorry, I'm not the king, I'm Perkin Warbeck from Tournay. He lists in great detail his family background and his lineage, and he lists all of the people in Tournay who know him. I mean, this is an incredibly long, lengthy list of people. It's not something you could just fake. You know, these are real people who have since been found in the Tournay records. And he basically, the gist of it is that he claims he is Perkin Warbeck and the son of Derek Warbeck. And they are a family, a boating family from Tournay. And Tournay is a French-speaking part of the Low Countries. So it's a dual heritage place. They speak Flemish and French. Um, so his name is either in Flemish, Pierre's Ospec, or it is in French, Pierre Con Webeck. It's, it's Perkin Warbeck um, is, is the name he was given by the English, which during this period, you always kind of bastardize the real name somewhat. And, you know, he just claims that he had been put forward by a group of conspirators to claim that he was this prince. It's a fascinating conspiracy. It's very believable. It's very lengthy. Many critics of it will claim that, of course, he confessed to being a fake prince. He was under duress. You know, he'd been captured the Tudor regime. But in the previous years... The critical thing here is that the Spanish, who were allies of Henry VII, they were doing their own investigations. They weren't happy about this because they were trying to do a marriage between their daughter, Catherine of Aragon, and Arthur Tudor. So they wanted to find out what was going on. And it was revealed during their investigations who Perkin Warbeck was. And his confession that he gives matches up, it corroborates the Spanish investigations that were conducted before Perkin Warbeck was captured, and they were conducted outside Henry VII's influence. You know, these were Spanish and Portuguese investigations. Years earlier, the French themselves had been telling Henry VII and the Scottish that Perkin Warbeck was a fraud. It was out there in the world long before he got captured that he was an imposter from Tony. And his confession just really brings it all together quite neatly. But as always, with anything related to the Princess of the Tower, you're either going to believe it or you're not going to believe it. I think a question, Nathan, that I always see or a comment that I always see when this discussion comes up about Perkin Warbeck is he obviously he was captured. He spent time at the Tudor court. Elizabeth of York, had he been the real <laughs> Richard, Duke of York, would have been that would have been her brother. Right. And presumably she would have been able to say definitely this is my brother or this is not my brother. So do we have a record of Elizabeth ever speaking about Warbeck or negating that he was actually her brother or any comments about him? We have nothing. It's blanket silence. And that in itself is not necessarily needs to be taken as suggestive of anything. I mean, at the end of the day, women of this period, unfortunately, are not present a lot at the forefront of events like this are certainly not as much as they as you know Elizabeth's granddaughters would or even her, do- her daughters you know she is absent quite heavily in general from the mechanics of the early Tudor court or early Tudor government rather than the court um so we don't we don't have anything now a couple of thoughts are that first and foremost she may not have known her brother that well or recognized him all these years later it's possible it's possible not. Um, she definitely would have seen Perkin Warbeck, however, around court. Because when he was captured, Perkin Warbeck was not executed. He was not imprisoned. He was allowed to live freely around the royal court. Which, again, people don't give Henry VII enough credit for his magnanimous nature. You know, he wasn't spiteful. He wasn't cruel. He let Warbeck live around the court. Now, yes, of course, Warbeck would have been made fun of. He would have been a bit of a joker around court. People would have laughed at him. But he was free to live there. And Elizabeth would have seen him. She would have recognised him. Um, There's also this idea that she would have intervened for her brother. You know, she would have helped him and so on. Well, would she? I mean, by this point, she's not necessarily a princess of York anymore. She's a Tudor queen. Her loyalties are 100% wrapped up in her children and their future. Even if she had believed that he was her brother, he is now a threat to 
the prosperity and the future of her children. She's not going to suddenly disinherit their prospects in return for her, her brother, who she hasn't seen for all this time, and you know may even be hostile to her for marrying a, a, a Tudor king. Um, but the the boring answer is no. We have nothing whatsoever about this supposed meeting or letters and so on that I sometimes hear about. Yes, I think that's just good good fodder for um, novelists and, and screenwriters, <laughs> I think. Um, so tell us what actually does happen to, to Warbeck. You said he's allowed to live kind of freely in the Tudor court, but obviously it doesn't end well for him. So can you tell us just a little bit about what happened? Yeah, one night uh, in Westminster, he sees an open window and he jumps through it and tries to escape. Uh, he only gets about a couple of miles down river, Henry the Seventh loses loses his mind and orders all of his guardsmen to go find him. Uh, they do find him. Like I said, he only got a couple of miles down the river, and this time they throw him in the Tower of London. Now it's in the Tower of London. So again, Henry the Seventh hasn't executed him at this point. He's still granted him his life, um, thrown him in the Tower of London. Another conspiracy is brewing at this time, however. So there are a group of other conspirators who have who have so far managed to escape the axemen. And they are now putting together a plot to launch an attack on the Tower of London and free the other prince who's still in there, and that is the Earl of Warwick. So all these years later, our old friend, the Earl of Warwick, is still in the Tower of London. He's aged about 24 years old, and there are people out there who still have their loyalties to him. They're trying to launch launch a conspiracy, and it's during this time that Perkin Warbeck gets involved in it. These conspirators are, are coming and going from the castle. You know, they've, they've got an inside man and they're speaking to Warbeck. They're speaking to Warwick. And Warwick and Warbeck, we're told, are speaking to each other through a hole in the floor. Um, their chambers are above each other. Either way, the conspiracy gets exposed. I mean, at the end of the Henry VII spies everywhere. It gets exposed. And Henry is being pressured by the Spanish to get rid of any dynastic threats before Catherine of Aragon comes to England. So there's enough of a conspiracy here. It's not concocted. It's not set up by the Tudor crown. That's quite a cynical way to look at things. The conspiracy is very detailed, and we still have the full court transcripts of everything that took place. It was enough to condemn poor Warwick, and Warwick was executed because of his Yorkist blood, essentially. He didn't seem to do too much wrong in this. You know, there was a conspiracy, but his part in it doesn't seem to have been too much. But unfortunately, he's condemned by his blood. And it's a bit of a blot on the reign of Henry VII that he has to execute him. But the hard, cold fact is he has to do it because he has to save his dynasty by marrying Arthur to the Spanish monarchy. So he executes Warwick. And in the interests of cleaning up some loose ends, he gets rid of Warbeck. Now, the key thing here is the difference in the executions. Warwick is beheaded on Tower Hill as a great magnate of the realm, and he is buried with his ancestors at Bisham Abbey in a funeral that is paid for completely by Henry VII. So I know some people think, so Henry VII executed him and then paid for his funeral. I mean, that's that's just what kings did back then, but it is some sort of recognition of his noble back, noble background. Warbeck is taken to Tyburn and is hanged like a commoner. There's no no royal beheading on Tower Hill for Warbeck. He's hanged like a commoner. The key thing for me when it comes to whether Perkin Warbeck was true or not is that just before he was hanged, he was given some final words and he admitted to the crowd for a final time that he was never the son of Edward IV. Some will say he's just saying that. I do not believe... In that day and age, he would lie about something just before meeting his maker. You know, he's got to settle all his debts with God before he's hanged. And that is the end of Perkin Warbeck. What a story. And this is why I love this period of history so much. You really just can't make this stuff up, can you? And you mentioned, Nathan, earlier briefly that he married Perkin Warbeck and he married a lady called, well, a woman called Lady Catherine Gordon. So what happens to his wife after he's executed? So Catherine Gordon is an interesting one. Um, we're often told that he was mar- that she was a, a cousin of the King of Scotland, and therefore this shows that the King of Scotland must have believed Perkin Warbeck because he wouldn't have humiliated his bloodline. She was not a cousin of the King of Scotland. She was related to the Scottish nobles, but she wasn't his 
cousin. So she is very distant from the Scottish crown. But nevertheless, we're told that she's a beautiful lady and she comes to England with Perkin Warbeck and she's captured. Henry VII does meet her and Perkin Warbeck has to confess to her that he was an imposter. And thereafter, she enters the service of Elizabeth of York. So she becomes one of Elizabeth of York's ladies and she marries three times later. Um, she would marry, I can't, I can't remember all their names, but she, I know she definitely marries one particular Welshman called Matthew Craddock, who's one of these Welshmen who comes to London and makes his fortune after Henry Tudor becomes king. And she just becomes a, a wealthy lady out in the provinces. You know, I think she, she lived in South Wales for a bit. Um, she makes no mention whatsoever ever again of Perkin Warbeck. There's n- no no mention of him in her will. She just becomes one of those background figures of the of the wider Tudor regime. But it's interesting that she came to court and uh, she straight away was put in the service of Elizabeth of York. So she possibly would have seen Perkin around court as well, but we have no um we have no real insight into them. She does seem to have had a son in Scotland with Perkin Warbeck, but the last mention of that son is just after they land in Cornwall. Uh, she's taken to an abbey. I would suggest that the child probably died during the journey or shortly there afterwards because um, there's no other reference to him ever again. A cynic might say, of course, the son disappeared, but we have no records of that son even up to the point Warbeck was captured. It just disappears. So fascinating. And there's a third pretender, Nathan, just briefly, you've been so generous with your time already, but the third pretender to lay claim to the Tudor throne. Just tell us a little bit about that person and what his fate was. So Ralph Wilford is a bit of an idiot. Essentially what's happened is we're, we're in the year 1499 and in February 1499, the um, at this time Warbeck and Warwick are still in the Tower of London. They get executed November 1499. So let's go back to February. Suddenly this lad is running around London claiming that he is the Earl of Warwick. I am Warwick, I am Warwick, I am the king. Within two weeks, he's captured and hanged. How quickly he is captured and hanged proves that Henry VII has finally lost complete patience. Enough of this stupid charade that's going on. He captures Wilford, he has him hanged, and he leaves, and his body's put in a gibber to be displayed to the people of uh, London. This is what happens if you keep on with this nonsense. Now, Wilford is a complete footnote in history. But it is his appearance and execution in February 1499 that really helps trigger the events later that year. Because it's been proven time and time again that Warwick is a problem. Henry can keep him in that tower all this all these years. But as Lambert Simler had shown, as Wilford had shown, as all these other plotters who kept on supporting Perkin Warbeck had shown, Warwick needed to die. Warwick throughout the entire of Henry VII's reign, was truly the threat. Even though he'd always been kept in the Tower of London, people were not letting his claim go. And we can circle this back very neatly to the princes in the Tower when we're told that the princes in the Tower were not a threat to Richard III because they would be made illegitimate. It's absolute nonsense because Warwick had shown that even though he was in the Tower of London, people would not let his claim go. And he had to get the chop in the end. And it's the same reason the princes in the tower had to be killed, because people were never going to let their claim go. So Wilford is just a complete idiot who's turned up in he's turned up in London, shouted a few silly things, he's got killed for it, and ultimately helped trigger the deaths of many other people just by being a bit of a moron. It's funny, I hadn't really heard of, of that person until I was looking into your book. So that's really interesting. And and I, I do feel for the poor Earl of Warwick. Like, what a tragic life, imprisoned for all that time. It just seems so awful and tragic, really, doesn't it? Yeah, he, you know, he, he's, a, he's a tragic figure of this entire period. And just like his cousins, the Prince in the Tower, he's doomed from the start because of his bloodline. I mean, I know many people do like the House of York, but I'm not too keen on those three brothers. I mean, Edward IV, Richard III, and George Duke of Clarence, they didn't half cause some problems with their ambitions. Um, and all of them doomed their children. You know, the, Edward IV, he, he, you know, his boys, as far as I'm concerned, and this history is pretty leans towards this day, this way that they were they were killed in the tower. Even if they weren't killed and spirited away, they certainly didn't live the life that they've been born to. 
Richard III, his son, died when he was on the throne, just a boy. And George Duke of Clarence, you know, he had condemned his son Warwick to a lifetime in the Tower. You know, people can say that um, he would potentially have been free under Richard III. We'll never know. The fact is, he would have been another potential problem for Richard III down the line. Same as he was a problem for Henry Tudor. Um, And yeah, it's, it's just a shame that he never really got to live his life properly. And Nathan, where can people find out more about you and your work and your books? I do normally say Twitter, but I'm not sure <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, a good recommendation these days. Yeah. Uh, but I'm definitely on Facebook and Instagram under my name, uh, Nathan Amin. And if all of social media goes to pot, <laughs> uh, my website should still be working, nathanamin.com. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us. I've just got one more quick question for you. And that is just for a Tudor takeaway. So I do ask all my guests to suggest something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode, maybe to, to get to know this period of time more. So do you have a Tudor takeaway for us? Um, my Tudor takeaway would be, uh, this is quite time limited, but if any of you should be in London before April next year, I strongly suggest trying to get yourselves to the National Archives. They currently have a free exhibition going on uh, called Treason. And two of the most significant documents they have on display are the trial records of Anne Boleyn and the tr- the attainder against Richard III. I mean, they also have the trial records of Thomas More. They have the entire trial records of Guy Fox. You know, this is an incredible exhibition, but it is something to see the charges levelled out in front of your own eyes against Anne Boleyn and the list of the people who were condemned with her. So if you can get there before April next year, I'd certainly recommend that. If you can't, do check it out online because there's plenty of pictures now doing the rounds of these documents, and you can see really what a what a document looks like when we when we talk about these historical records. Great, long, very confusing things. Absolutely, they sure are. And that's a wonderful takeaway and I hope to get to see it myself. So fingers crossed. Um, Thank you, Nathan, again for taking the time to talk Tudors with us. No problem. Thank you very much for having me back. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners. So if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family. And don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.